Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Goa On webinar series. My name is Sarah Flickinger and I'm an Associate Research Scientist at the International Atomic Energy Agency, OAICC. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which will explore what natural analogs can teach us about the future of coral communities and their understudied biodiversity. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the four organizations that sponsor this webinar series. First, Goa On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. Third, the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And finally, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to Goa On, it is a collaborative international network of over 900 members from 100 countries and territories designed to detect and understand the drivers of ocean acidification and the resulting impacts on marine ecosystems. During today's presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the questions box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel um, uh, of your screen. We'll be monitoring incoming questions and we'll pose them to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will begin immediately after the presentation. During this time, you can also raise your hand by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen and we will call on you to ask your question. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have Dr. Sylvan Agostini, who is an assistant professor at the Shimoda Marine Research Center at the University of Tsukuba. Dr. Agostini is studying the effects of climate change and ocean acidification on the ecophysiology of corals. Dr. Agostini especially focuses on research of coral ecosystems in marginal areas where communities are exposed to multiple stressors, taking advantage of natural analogs and gradients in CO2, pollutants, latitudinal temperature gradients, etc. He initiated the use of the Shikine Island CO2 seep and led the creation of the Icona network. Secondly, we have Dr. James Reimer, who is an associate professor at the University of the Rikus. Dr. Reimer is a leading scientist in the field of coral reef biodiversity. His research focuses on understudied groups, primarily benthic cnidarians, including zoantharians and their endosymbionts, as well as octocorals from shallow tropical coral reefs to the deep sea. Dr. Reimer is interested in how climate change and anthropogenic stressors will affect coral reef and marine biodiversity into the future, particularly from the viewpoint of understudied minor taxa, which may not be so minor in the future. I would like to give a very warm welcome to our speakers, and without further ado, I will turn it over to them for the presentation. Thank you very much. I believe Sylvain is going first, yes? Yeah, yeah, I will go. Okay. Um, share my screen. Okay. So, hey, everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, so, thanks, Sarah, for the nice introduction. So, my name is Silva Agostini, and uh, today I will be presenting sort of the first part of this talk, which is what natural analogs can teach us about the future of coral communities, focusing mostly on corals. And the second part will be done by James, uh, who will present us his uh, work on the understudied biodiversity. So, like, first of all, this is not only my work, and especially this PowerPoint and everything was, and most of the work was done uh, by, by uh, Ricardo Rodolfo Metalpa from uh, the, the New Caledonia, and lots of work for Haruko Kurihara from the University of the Rikus, and many, many others. And why many others is because like the natural analogs are spread all over the world. And so we are trying to collaborate now. But first, uh, I just want to like define what we are calling natural analogs. So natural analogs are an environment, an ecosystem 
that show the same characteristics, physical, chemical, and hopefully biological uh, characteristics as what we'll find in the future. In our case, we are mostly focusing on the natural analog for ozonification. And this is a tool. There are tools that allow us to study the ecosystem levels effect of ozonification. They represent a chronic exposure for hundreds or more years of exposure to elevated CO2. And through this chronic exposure, there will have been uh, ecological or physiological selections of winner species and individuals. Also, with some caveats, they, there is, um, this natural analog can allow us to study potential adaptation mechanisms of, uh, of marine organisms. In this talk, I will present a few uh, um, natural analogs, and mostly we can divide them in two categories. One are volcanic CO2 vents, also called CO2 seeps, and the other one are semi enclosed space. So this natural analog stuff has started quite recently, actually. In 2008, our colleague uh, Jason and Ricardo, actually, um, published a paper in the Nature showing the potential and the effect of ozonification ecosystem using a suit ships in Ischia at uh, the station, uh, uh, the logical station of Anton Don, at the mine station in Ischia in Italy. And then afterwards, there were many other SIPs, CO2 SIPs being described a little bit everywhere in the world, and a lot in the Western Pacific, including in Japan, where I'm based, because these SIPs are found in uh, volcanically active um, uh, areas. Swimming close base came much later, and today I will present uh, the work by Kuri Harrison and Ricardo on, in two of them, in one in Palau and the other one in Burake. But as you can see, uh, all over the world there are not so many of this natural analog. And so most recently we created this ICONA network, the International CO2 Natural Analog Network, which is a network of researchers that use natural analogs for signification. And by collaborating across many different countries, although it was initiated by Japan, uh, IRD in France, and the Palermo University in Italy. We are including more and more people, and we hope many people can join. And if by using several natural analogs in different uh, bio, biogeographical areas, we hope to understand more uh, a synthesis of the effect of ozonification on ecosystem. So the activity is, of course, to do, conduct research using natural analogs, but also we aim to publish some guidelines to help foster the use of future, perhaps yet to discovered natural analogs. And using all our finding at the end of, like let's say in five years, like to produce a report to uh, propose conservation strategies for marine ecosystems. And so as you can see, one of the output of this project our direct output is Goa on, of course, and uh, OAIC and IOC. And like this webinar is a great chance to, for us to interact with the Goa on community and the overall researcher community that works on ocean certification. Okay, but let's start to talk about research. So the first uh, results I will be presenting come from co 2 SIPs. And I will start with uh, the results obtained by Ricardo Rodolfo Medalpa and uh, Fanny Ubrek from the IRD in New Caledonia, and many, many collaborators from AIMS, CNRS, and uh, Elliot Lab, uh, this is me actually, and other, other, during a project that was named Carioca, so it preceded ICONA. So this, uh, is, this work was done at two sealed ships in Papua New Guinea, so very tropical. Uh, coral reefs, the first one in Ambital Island and the other one in Nambi Island. So starting with the, what the chemistry, first the pH, what I think interests most of us, and pH meaning pCO2. And you can see it's quite a characteristic of CO2 seeps. Um, the pH is reduced in the elevated areas, but it's also quite variable. So it's not always a perfect analog for ozonification. 
but in some sites, like in the ambital sites, you have a much less variations compared to the normal by sites. And this highlights very much the fact, the, the importance of choosing your site when using a natural analogs, like a good and variable site, or, or to consider that your site may show extreme variation and to try to understand the effects on this uh, variation pH. What Ricardo and his team found is first in Ambital and uh, in Norman Bay, the, the uh, coral population, uh, the, especially the diversity in corals was reduced in both sites, but the coral average, uh, the coral abundance was most, most importantly reduced at the Norman Bay sites. And Norman Bay sites in the vent, the full ecosystem is completely dominated by some massive parietes and the hypothesis is that there is no more space for recruits for other perhaps like uh, less resistant species and this caused a drastic shift in the coral community. Another point is that although the diversity was lower, there you can still find quite a lot of species of corals and this highlights again that some species or some individuals within uh, corals may be able to survive uh, oceanification. There were some perhaps beneficial effects and we found like uh, the photosynthesis in for corals in silt seeps, so that were that grew and uh, incubated under elevated CO2s uh, show higher photosynthesis rate than reference corals. And also the and studied by Como et al. at the same sites also showed that although the pH at the calcification sites, so the calcif calcifying fluids of the corals uh, sampled in the, uh, in the elevated CO2 areas was reduced, the pH at the, cal the calcification fluids was still higher than seawater and was still high enough for the corals to uh, be able to calcify. So the effect of oceanification, yes, is visible, but the corals have some homeostatic ways to maintain an elevated site and maintain a minimum of calcification. Moving further uh, northward in the, the Pacific, in the Western Pacific, the work by Kurihara, Haruko Kurihara and Hajime uh, Kaene, especially, uh, at the uh, Sip in Iotorishima, so in Japan, so Iotorishima is located um, in the northern part of the Ryukyu Archipelago, uh, about like 29 or, uh, degree uh, north, and it's uh, in the subtropical zone. The site being used is a mid silt site, mildly elevated, I would say, and here so you have quite large variation in CO2, and this is mostly depending on the tide, and this again is quite a, a, a characteristics of natural analogs, or where often the CO2 is dependent on the tide, depending how close the bay is. In this site, you have a very clear shift uh, from hard cores in, at reference site, ambient CO2 sites, to soft cores at moderately elevated CO2, and then in the very high CO2 sites, you have very few uh, hard or soft cores. This was described in 2012. And if you look at the effect of CO2 on this hard core that dominate the reference sites and the soft core that dominate uh, the elevated sites, you see that soft cores, they are not really affected on the calcification is not really affected to the moderately elevation of CO2. And the if negative effect of CO2 is only visible at the most important like 1500 pCO2 levels. On the opposite, hardcore classification here, like decreased severely, even uh, under like moderately uh, elevated, or well, 900 is not that moderate, but elevated CO2. What is interesting, and this will be, as I'm pretty sure, the uh, topic of the, the talk by James, is that instead of the hardcore, the reef becomes completely dominated by other species, for example, soft cores, 
are also very interestingly blue quartz, that although these two groups have night skeletons, they seem tolerant to this elevated uh, um, CO2 uh, level, especially at 800 ppm, but not 1500, where you start to see a decrease even in this more resistant group. Moving again further northward, I would like to talk about the silt ship in Shikine Island, Japan, where I've been working with lots of my colleagues from the University of Tsukuba, uh, Harvey, Wala, Kong, Borjo, and or from Plymouth Hall, Jason Hall Spencer, but also collaborator from Italy, um, who works a lot on natural analogs, especially Marco Milazzo, uh, uh, Carlo Catano, or Fabio Badalamenti from uh, University of Palermo and Siena. So the Shikine Iron Seal Sips is located in a bay named Mikawa Bay. And you can see on this map, actually there is different venting area with the main venting area on the uh, left, on the west of the map. But we actually never work here because the pH are just crazy low and CO2 is crazy high. And we work mostly more moderate, uh, at more moderate stations that is still at several uh, um, hectare, I would say it's a 100 meter by 100 meter square. Uh, it's very uh, wide area of um, the ecosystem that is exposed to about 900 ppm uh, CO2. And here again, you have some uh, peak in CO2, like quite variable, but the variability is not terrible. And with an average PCO2 at about 7.85. Because the bay is actually all under the influence of this uh, um, vent, we are using a bay next to it to uh, use as the reference site. In this more like at the very limit for the northern limit for quartz, we see a very drastic change in the community, where in the reference site you have a community dominated by hard quartz and uh, microalgae. But as soon as the pH increase, even by 100 ppm, you see a complete disappearance of the quartz and 900 ppm, you, the ecosystem is mostly uh, covered or smothered by a different type of turf algae. This re results in a very um, drastic drop in the complexity of the ecosystem, meaning complexity is kind of a proxy for a habitat provisioning. And so like you can understand that this will have cascading effects throughout the ecosystem. If we look again at the effect on coral calcifications, we can distinguish two groups of corals. For example, it's Acropora, Acropora solitarinensis, show cross season a decreased in calcification rate or growth rate at the high CO2 sites. And these corals can be like treated as losing species, is mostly not found under elevated CO2. But if we compare to uh, this Porites heronensis, uh, which is not very abundant, but we can find it in the elevated PCO2 area. This species is actually not affected by ocenification, and its calcification rate is not decreased under high CO2. Although this is a very slow growing species, and the, its growth rate is much uh, lower than the Acropora uh, species. And the, going from this winning versus loser, losing species, we did a study where we sampled a couple of uh, winning species that can be found in uh, Shikina Island, but so, this was also done in North Mumbai with uh, Ricardo's team in PNG, and losing species that cannot be found uh, in these elevated areas, but they are commonly found in control areas. And we study a bunch of physiological parameters, and we found some difference. For example, the winning species, they have low tissue biomass compared to the high to the to the losing species and as a result uh, the biomass specific energy production so the mitochondrial um, uh, rates for winning species is higher than the lower the, for than the losing species so the idea is part that the winning species um, have different potential and different allocation of their energy pot, uh, production and ATP production and this can make help them maintaining uh, calcification and metabolism under even elevated CO2 um, conditions. And so this hints at winning species. So some species within uh, corals 
may have some inherent physiological characteristics that allow them to survive elevated PC2. The problem here is very much focused on physiology, and it's not only physiology that will determine the future of the community. And this is another example in Chikine, where you have macroalgae in green here, and, but what interests us in pores, which are present under, uh, sorry, elevated pH, or like, oh, sorry, like high pH, reference pH. But you see that these uh, two groups, but especially the pores, immediately decrease, and the ecosystem is completely replaced by a tough algae, like um, massive tough algae that mother all the rocks. And this will modify uh, the, the chemical environment at the surface of the sediment of the rocks and could inhibit a recruitment through this alteration of the chemical environment, but also competition for space. We did also some experiment on, on the effect of chemical Q from ambient or low pH community. We did it also in Italy with colleagues from Italy using Asteroides calcularis and in Japan using Alvo Pola Japonica. And although Asteroides was not, the, the, the larvae didn't prefer any of the community, the larvae of the product clearly preferred the ambient community. And this highlight that it's not only the physiology, but there will be indirect effects of uh, shifting communities. So to summarize CO2 vents, our certification will affect the physiology and ecology uh, of um, coral, coral communities. And this will cause a decrease in coral abundance and diversity, a shift of the ecosystem to other taxa, and this will be what James will be calling, and it seems that perhaps the, the effects are more pronounced in higher latitudes, perhaps because the turf is also favored by the lower temperature. But nevertheless, some coral species show some resistance, and some corals are still able to survive the elevated CO2 condition. Also, a caveat of CO2 vents, these are very open system often, and so perhaps they do not represent the full adaptation of corals, but they are still a quite good tool to, to use for, for the study. And, and this is a second part, we have also a semi-enclosed lagoon or bays that show a um, less open system and can show perhaps better the potential uh, mechanisms. So the first one is uh, uh, the work done by uh, Ricardo and Sissim and Fanny and many, many other collaborators, PhD student from IRD or other universities and collaborators from different universities uh, from, I think, all over the world. So Burake is located in New Caledonia, and the system is quite complex. And you have, compared to reference site where you have very stable um, uh, condition, in Burake you have more variable conditions, mostly driven by the tide, with increase in temperature, decrease in pH, and decrease in DO, in the cell of oxygen. And so here you have not only an analog for oceanification, but also perhaps for warming and deoxygenation. What is very interesting to see is that when you sample cores from uh, uh, Burake, and so, so from the elevated PCO2 and like altered chem chemistry of the natural analogs, these cores and the, even in aquariums show a better growth than cores sampled from the outside. Uh, 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 of the bay, of the, the natural analogs, under control or lower or variable pH. And so this again hints some potential adaptation. In Brake also, there is a quite a good coral recruitment within the bay, as it was shown using recruiting tiles. And so you have quite a lot of seeding happening within the bay, and the coral do reproduce within this elevated uh, PCO2 natural analogs. Going to another swimming close bay, this time in Palau, with the work by Kurihara and uh, uh, Yingnang uh, from uh, Palau and Asushi Watanabe, mostly in Tokyo Technology uh, Institute. And you see like a very beautiful, I've not been yet, I hope to go next year, but very beautiful bay where you also have, uh, similar to Burake, you have some difference in temperature and difference in pH with higher temperature and lower pH, resulting in a decreased omega aragonite um, within the bay. It's a very clear, actually, it's due to the uh, circulation within the bay, 
And so you can define different zones with different uh, levels of uh, CO2. What is very interesting in this site is the hard cores do not, the abundance, the coverage in the hard cores do not change according to the omega aragonite, but the diversity, uh, the composition of the community structure do change. And you have some uh, branching points that are almost absent in the uh, high PCO2, lower omega aragonite. Acrobat are also very rare in the uh, lower PCO2, uh, lower omega aragonite. But some million DNA uh, cores do increase, uh, well, become dominant uh, within the high CO2. Similar to the Buraki results, uh, the team from Kurihara found that if it were to transplant cores from outside of the uh, Nico Bay, so it's natural analog to inside, they all died. But if you transplant cores from outside, uh, from sorry, from inside the natural back to inside, they do survive and do good, and they do even better than if they were out transplanted outside of the bay. And similar results on different species is again cores from Nico to from the natural analog to the natural analog do good. Actually, they do grow well. well. They do uh, respire less, and they have good uh, photosynthesis respiration. But if you were to transplant so the blue here reference cores to NICO, their um, calcification rate and, and overall metabolism is greatly affected by the elevated uh, conditions in CO2. From going from the adults to uh, the larvae and the next generation, so because in, they were able to get some uh, larvae from cores from inside the natural analog, so solar generation of cores. And similar to the adult uh, results, they found that if you are to rear these larvae under elevated CO2, the one that were originated from uh, the control condition would show decreased lipid contents if they were uh, reared under elevated CO2. But larvae that come from other colony found in the uh, elevated CO2 areas were not affected, at least the lipid content was not affected by an increase in uh, CO2. Then the recruitment, and this is perhaps uh, the important point, is that the recruitment for some species of cores, for example, here porites, was not affected by CO2, but recruitment of species from Acropora, here on the top graph, was affected and meaning that there was very low recruitment and in the Nico Bay from parts of uh, the Acropora group. So in summary for the enclosed bay, again, oceanification will affect the physiology and ecology of core communities. And this will cause a shift in core diversity. But as it was exemplified by this bay, Burake and um, um, Palau, Nico Bay, it may not always translate in a complete decrease or drastic decrease in core coverage. So it would be a shift in the community, but not always a decrease in core coverage. And so because this system are semi-enclosed, I would say, maybe they, and there are some studies uh, by Kurihara et al. that show that the, the, the recruitment that you have larvae that are being, uh, uh, originated from within the natural analog can recruit within the natural analog. And this hints strongly to some potential for adaptation across multiple generations. So in conclusion, oceanification will certainly change the reef that we know today. It will not have the same reef in the future. And perhaps under limited disturbance, the course may show some adaptation to elevated CO2 condition, but we should not forget that you have also warming and unfortunately, uh, other anthropogenic stressors that remain, and this approach uh, is local stressor or global stressors will still greatly affect the coral communities. Natural analog provides a unique opportunity to investigate the chronic, ecological, and physiological effects. Ecological effects are mostly impossible to study in, in aquariums, and so it's important to, to consider natural analogs to go to the ecosystem levels. 
But unfortunately, due to the uniqueness, I would say, it is they are quite rare, and it is urgent to collaborate and exchange to make full use of these great tools. And that's why we uh, created the international CO two natural analogs. Okay, this finished my parts, and I give the hand to James, who will. Oh, actually, I think I had no side. Okay, so about the other one. All right, okay. thank you, Savan. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay. Well, let's go back. Uh, there we go. Okay. You can see okay? It's all okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I'd particularly like to thank Sylvain because he did a very good job of introducing all of these different sites. And he also used the word coral a lot. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk about coral. So let's get into it, shall we? So starting off with a question, what are corals? And so I'm, I'm guessing when Sylvain was talking about corals, he meant uh, zooxanthellate scleractinian corals, like these ones in the center here, these sort of acroporas amongst the algae. But actually, corals have a lot of different meanings. And this is something that uh, I think um, as scientists, we have to be careful about and also we need to think about. So for example, corals, um, precious coral, a lot of people call precious coral coral, um, pericorallium, corallium, red coral, etc. Gold coral, another precious coral, red coral. Fire coral, completely different lineage of hydrozoans, yet they are called coral. Blue coral, which uh, Sylvain talked about, hexacorals, octocorals, hydrocorals, hermatypic, ahermatypic corals, soft corals, naked corals, black corals. There's a lot of coral out there. And None of these corals, except for perhaps hexacorals, are really what we're talking about when we're saying coral reefs or coral communities. Um, but that's not actually always the case. And I think we need to be a little bit more inclusive about what we're talking about when we say corals. And for example, um, I also went to Google today. Uh, here's what I found on Google when I put in the word corals. And what you can see is actually Google might have a better image than a lot of us scientists, except well, they've got some sponges in here. They seem to like a lot of fluorescent colors, but there's a lot of soft corals. Um, the, the idea of corals is very amorphous. And so usually we are talking about zooxanthellate, shallow water, subtropical to tropical sclerectinian corals. But at these natural analogs, just as Sylvain had mentioned, you, you're actually seeing a lot of other corals. And so this is sort of what I want to talk about today is corals, not corals, but corals, so to speak. So. For example, uh, this is millipora. This is, uh, there's maybe five, 10 species of this. It's often called fire coral because it can give you a nasty sting. Um, Lewis in 1989 specifically said there is a lack of quantitative ecological data. These groups are found in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and we really don't know a lot about them, but they're really, really common on a lot of coral reefs. Um, they're similar to scleractinians. They make skeletons, they form part of the coral reef, but they aren't preyed upon by crown of thorns starfish, for example. They're immune to most or all coral diseases. We don't really know because not many people are studying millipora. And so this is a group of corals that we wouldn't consider corals, but yet they're actually really important players in coral reef ecosystems. Another group, uh, Sylvain mentioned, this was Heliopora species, blue corals. Sorry, the picture's not the best, um, but there's one big colony here and another colony here. If you break it, the skeleton is actually has a, has a blue tinge to it. Um, they're listed as uncommon to rare and as vulnerable due to climate change by the IUCN. So they are under some kind of protection. But at the same time, um, they're considered living fossils, which means they have lived through one or more massive extinction events, at least since the Cretaceous. They are known to have higher optimum temperatures for growth and um, the growth actually higher temperatures promotes more settlement. And there are at least several species more than we had thought, which indicates that this lineage is somewhat evolutionarily successful. So obviously there's a bit of a disconnect between sort of what we know about corals and actually maybe what's happening sometimes on, on, on reefs under climate change. And so here's my really brave prediction or my brave conclusion for the, for the first part of this. I'm going to basically say that, oh, sorry, we, wrote, we don't really know much about a lot of corals. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and so I 
am very, very new to the natural analog and, and ocean acidification and high PCO2 sort of research. Um, I can barely spell PCO2. Um, but at the same time, my original background is working a lot on zoanthariums, which are basically cousins of corals, square actinian corals. They're nidarians, they're benthos, they're related to sea anemones and hard corals. There's some pictures of them here. And the thing that I really like about zoanthariums is they're found in almost all marine ecosystems, but they're really understudied. And today I'm going to focus on coral reef zoanthariums. Specifically here, there's two generic names at the bottom, zoanthus and palithoa. Uh, they have symbiodinaceae, or as you might know, symbiodinium um, in the past. Uh, they have endosymbiotic zooxanthellae, so they're just like Scleractinian corals, they are photosynthesizing with their endosymbionts and living on coral reefs. So um, what I thought would be an interesting topic is to talk about zoanthariums at natural analog sites. And so basically, um, as a member of ICONA um, and with other members, uh, we visited various CO2 and seeps and enclosed base sites over the past 10 years. And so I went to most of these sites, but not all of these sites. So I received images or videos or, or specimens, for example, from collaborators. And we looked to see what we could find for the presence and abundance of zoanthariums at different natural analog sites, both CO2 seeps and enclosed bays. And so let's see what we find in the classic sense of science, right? And so, okay. This is Iotorishima. Um, these images are shamelessly stolen from the Icono homepage. This is a CO2 seep in the Riku Islands, Japan, which Sylvain introduced. Um, and Zoanthus and Palitho are present at the site. Uh, they were mentioned briefly in Inoue et al. 2013, which is uh, Kurihara Sensei's work. And actually, when we went back there in 2021 or 20, um, Palithoa the ones here, not the small ones with the white circles, but the bigger ones, the tannish ones here, were actually dominant at a lot of areas where right next to seeps. So this was something that sort of started to get my mind thinking, hmm, well, these palithoa seems to really like these seeps. So that's interesting, I thought. And this was really my first experience with these sites. Um, Shikinejima, in the same year, a bit later on, went up here to mainland Japan visiting uh, Sylvain, Shigeki, and Ben. And again, zoanthus and palithoa were there. Uh, this is unpublished data, but um, they were quite dominant in areas of pretty high PCO2, uh, 800 to 1200 ppm. And you would often find large colonies of a meter or two in diameter, two to three species. Uh, we're still working on this. This is under preparation. But again, um, often the dominant benthos. Something interesting, something to think about, right? Then uh, Nico Bay, uh, or actually, Nico Bay was the first site that I had been to, but I'd never really thought of it as a natural analog, but more just as a semi-enclosed bay. Um, Gobu et al, including Kurihara-san, did work showing that this the waters in this bay are really um, slightly more acidic, slightly higher temperature. And when we went there, again, we found zoanthus. Um, I'll show you actually in this next slide here. Um, and it was actually dominant in certain locations in the bay, all over the bay. Um, Nico Bay, has a really interesting sort of morphology in that you have this intertidal notch. So this is this white line here sort of is the, the side profile of a reef. And so the, the blue line here would be the water line. And the, the tide line basically has etched away at the limestone. And so you have this notch area that's partially shaded um, and receives sometimes a bit of sunlight, but it is often quite dark. And in this notch area, which is, Intertidal, maybe a meter deep maximum, the dominant benthos is Zoanthus, Zoanthus sensibaricus. You find the same species, but not in as many numbers on the mid slope and down at the bottom of the bay at around 20 meters. So this was again, uh, this was something that I thought was peculiar when I first went there, but after visiting Shikene and Yuo Torishima, really started to think, well, there's maybe there's something going on here. Then uh, last month, went to Borake, which is a semi-enclosed bay in New Caledonia um, and a really unique spot. And again, Palithoa and Zoanthus, we found um, in large numbers in the bay. This is unpublished. This is uh, sort of what I'm working on right now, actually right now. Um, Palithoa was actually dominant benthos in the back of the lagoon at the entrance, at the very beginning of this channel where all the water is flowing out of the mangrove forest. How, how dominant? like this dominant, um, pretty much 
an area of 40 by 30 meters is nothing but this one species of Palithoa, Palithoa mutuki. So again, something interesting to think about. Uh, Ambitil Island, uh, I received videos from Ricardo Rodolfo Metalpa last week. And uh, when I was stuck in a hotel at Narita Airport, I was analyzing them. I don't have the images yet to show you, but I can tell you that there are Palithoa and Zoanthus at this site as well. So we have checked out five different natural analog sites and we have found Zoantherians often at all the sites dominant in small to large patches. Here's a sort of a summary, um, sort of summarizing each of the bays or islands or locations, whether they're a seep or a bay. But the important thing here, um, there's three species that we found very commonly, two species of Palitho and this one species of Zoanthus. This Zoanthus species, Zoanthus sansibaricus, we found everywhere. Um, this species is known to be a generalist. It is found from the intertidal zone to 50 meters deep. Um, but it also seems to be a generalist or do well in these sort of natural analog or disturbed sites. Palithor tuberculosa um, did not seem to like enclosed bays, but its CO2 seeps was very, very common. So I want to talk for the last bit of time about these two um, species and maybe what, what are they doing? Why are they doing so well in these locations? So let's talk a little bit about it. Um, so yeah, there's the brave conclusion. Some species of Zoanthus and Palithoa seem to be doing well at natural analog sites. Okay, so why? How can we explain this? I can think of four things that I'm quickly going to talk about. One is possibly their endosymbionts. They're what people used to call symbiodinium. Now we call the family Symbiodinaceae. Um, there are some characteristics of this group that might be interesting. I think they also have a flexible nutritional strategy, trophic plasticity, so to speak. Uh, as well. They do not have a skeleton, um, which I think is something important that we need to discuss. And finally, I really think that some of these species have a, just a general love for disturbed environments in general. I think this is sort of their, their strategy for surviving on coral reefs. So let's look at each of these with a few slides. Okay, for the symbionts, um, I have data from a lot of different locations, but I'm going to show you data from Palau today. Um, Basically, we sampled specimens from the intertidal notch in Nico Bay, from the mid-slope, and also from the bottom of the bay. And we sequenced the symbionts of each of these specimens to see what we could find. Um, and we also took environmental information, uh, temperature and light, to start with. And what you can see here is that this intertidal, the, the temperatures are all very, very similar, but the light levels are incredibly different. Um, the intertidal notch actually has lower light levels than at the mid slope at eight meters, but it has a lot of variability and a very high max. Um, again, this is not PAR, this is total light, so we need to adjust this for PAR. But basically, this intertidal notch is dark, not as dark as 20 meters, but still very dark, but also very variable. So it's a very different environment than the more steady and stable mid slope and bottom environments. And when we sequenced the symbionts from Nico Bay, what we found was really rather interesting. Most of the colonies in Nico Bay had a generalist that you find at all different depths. You find it in the deep, you find it in a notch, and you find it in the shallows. And it's closely related to what we would see on reefs in Okinawa or Australia. But the notch, 13 of 16 notch colonies, um, so not 100%, but, but statistically significant, most of the notch colonies had a, a slightly different lineage that was genetically distinct from what you saw all across the Pacific. And so given the isolation time of approximately 8,000 years of Nico Bay, I'd like to posit that perhaps this symbiont and the zoanthorin have somehow slightly evolved to take advantage of this uh, notch environment where there's not many other corals, so to speak. What about trophic plasticity? Um, so again, this is work with the other species, Palithoa, the one that we found at all the CO2 seeps. And we did work at Dongsha Atoll um, in Palau and also in the Chesterfield Islands. And we looked at colonies in shallow, almost zero to five meters of water, and then at deep, 25 to 30 meters of water. Um, and this was worked by a former PhD student of mine, Maria Santos, um, came out last year. And what she found was actually really at first kind of counter instinctive, but when we thought about it, it makes sense. This species seems to eat more plankton in shallower waters using stable isotope analyses. You can have the, the darker 
are, hang on, shall we have some middle depths? Um, so the darker are the host, and then the lighter color are the symbionts. But basically, you see the same pattern at all of these different sites. The shallow zoantherians are eating more plankton and relying less on their symbionts, whereas in the deep, down at 25 to 30 meters, they're almost completely relying on their symbionts. In other words, in the shallow waters uh, where there's higher light levels, higher stress, higher temperatures, um, they have multiple sources of nutrition. And this would fit with uh, observations of Palaeothoa species that we've seen where these species often bleach in that they lose their symbionts, but they don't die, unlike a lot of corals, scleractinian corals. So these animals seem to be a little bit more flexible in how they're acquiring their nutrition, especially in shallow, higher stress environments. So this could be another tool that maybe these zoantherians are using at natural analog sites. The third thing that we need to discuss is the lack of a skeleton. Zoantherians do not have a skeleton. And when you actually look at them, their evolution over time, uh, the resolution is a bit low, but basically zoantherians uh, evolved approximately 600, 650 million years ago uh, during a period of calcite seas with high levels of CO2, which might explain why they evolved. Um, and uniquely among all the corals out there, there are corals that do not have any skeleton. Um, Scleractinia, some octocorals, blue coral, for example, they, um, they make a skeleton. Most octocorals make sclerites. These animals do not make anything. What they do instead is they take in sand and detritus from their surrounding environment to make their structure stronger. Um, a few groups do not but most groups do within zoantheria. So again, this is a, a different strategy to create sort of protection and skeleton and structure that doesn't rely on calcification, which could also explain um, why some of these species do well in natural analogs. And finally, um, I really think that not all, but there are some species, for, in particular, those three that we saw, Palitho turbiculosa, Palitho mutuki, pal uh, Zoanthus antibioticus, they really have a love of sort of disturbed or somewhat marginal environments. Uh, this is a figure from uh, a paper we put out last year where we were documenting basically a literature review where we went through all the literature and we were documenting where um, zoantherian barrens, we call them, basically large areas where almost 100% cover of zoantherians have been found. They've been found in the Atlantic. They've been found in the Pacific. Um, it seems to be really pretty much uh, a global phenomenon. There's not a lot of information out there, but what was interesting is when we looked at all of the different um, papers, usually uh, local stressors such as runoff or sewage, et cetera, these uh, turbidity, et cetera, these things were implicated in each of these locations. Does this mean that this is what is happening? Well, not necessarily. This is what all of the researchers thought at that point in time. But there is a pattern there that I think needs to be investigated more into the future. So in summary, what can we say? Um, well, the future is not just corals. It's corals and, and other things too. This is a picture from Buraki I really like because you have a sponge, a soft coral, some algae, your normal coral, so to speak. And you also have zoantherians in the background all over the place. So not only sponges and algae for which there really needs to be more research, but millipora species, heliopora species, nanipora species, soft corals, zoanthus and palithoa species, all of these animals need more basic ecological research. Not all of these animals are going to do well. Not all of these species are going to do well, do well in the future, but some of these, some species in each of these groups appear to have uh, a very interesting toolkit or a tool set that we need to learn more about to understand why they're doing so well in these environments that theoretically um, should be very harsh for most corals. So what can we say in the future? Many species of these groups will become more prevalent as corals decline. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you to all the ICONA members that made a lot of this field work possible. Uh, Sylvain, of course, Ben Shigeki at Shimoda, Tim Ravasi at OIST, Haruko Kurihara at uh, my university, the University of the Ryukyus, 
uh, Ricardo at IRD, and of course, people in Palau, numerous other people, and the, the funding from uh, Icona and in the past in Palau, the Satraps project. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and say thank you very much. And I guess we go to questions perhaps, yes? Yes, of course. Thank you so much, James. Um, and thank you to both of our presenters for your wonderful presentations. Um, at this time, I will begin asking our speakers questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to remind everyone who has joined that you are welcome to type in your questions to the chat box, um, or you can click the raise hand um, icon at the bottom of your screen and we can unmute you to ask your question live. Um, and while we wait for questions to start trickling in, I have a general question for our speakers. Um, since Goa On is a network of scientists from many career stages. Um, I was wondering if you could briefly touch on how you got into this line of research and if you have any words of wisdom or advice for students or early career scientists who are maybe looking to get into ocean acidification work or work with natural analogs, um, could you share that at this time um, as well? What do you think, Savan? You want to go ahead? You go first. I'm new to this. Okay, I'm also new. I mean, like, so, so well, I think uh, it, you, you, it's mostly like work hard, I would like say, and but enjoy what you are doing, and uh, then uh, you succeed. <laughs> I hope. Uh, after, like, I think can clearly be seen, like James and I, we are based in Japan. Uh, I go on, go on. It's all international. We live in an international world, so collaborate and like meet people from all over the world and enjoy multiple cultures and everything, and and. And to be ben beneficial. Unfortunately, with uh, COVID, it's not easy to travel. But if you can, like, meet people even online, like today, it is also a good solution. Anything else to add, James? Um, I think the only other thing to add is, you know, um, I think actually your talk sort of mentioned that too. You know, some of the first papers on natural analogs were two thousand eight. Some of them on enclosed bays were, you know, ten years later, two thousand eighteen, two thousand sixteen. You know, and and probably. You know, people might have had ideas with, ah, nah, you know, no one's interested. No one's doing that, so to speak. And uh, I've been working on a lot of different things, but sort of my my start was zoanthariums. And people told me, you you won't survive. You know, there's no way you're, you're going to have a career working on this weird group of animals. Um, and I'm not saying work on this weird group of animals, but what I am saying is, you know, if you have an idea and you think it's important and you share it, you know, you might actually convince some other people that it's important too. And so, you know, no matter what career stage you're at, especially, but especially for young, younger researchers, you know, um, it, it, you know, be a scientist, you know, collect the data, but if you have beliefs or convictions that the data support, it's, you know, and, and have fun, but get the message out and you might be still around 20 years later. You know, I, th I think, um, my view on things is, uh, I think Sylvain was always probably a good student. I'm not sure I was, but if, if I could do it, anyone can do it. So I, I'd really say, don't give up and uh, stay positive. And also, you know, find that niche or find that thing that you find interesting and, and really work on it, get to understand it. That was great advice. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we're having questions coming in. And the first one is for Dr. Agostini. Um, it says, many of these natural analog sites are actually multi-stressor environments where many parameters in addition to pH are different, such as temperature and dissolved oxygen, but also often nutrients and light. And how do you take this into account when predicting coral responses to ocean acidification? Yeah, very good question. It's is very nice who is asking. I very much like our research also, so we really need to collaborate. But uh, uh, I mean, like the first thing is, it's not a problem that's multi-stressor, I think. Like the future world will not be a single stressor world. It will be multiple stressor. Uh, like special temperature will be higher. The oxygenation is happening. Nutrient runoff are very common. So uh, of, theoretically, of course, like if we want to know the physiological mechanism and so on of the effect of photosynification, the best will be to have a single a natural analog for significant natural analog for temperature, etc. etc. But because they are kind of natural, first, it's 
not of is often not possible. There, there are ways, <clears throat> like for example, in Skinnen, we actually found a, another site, a C5 site in, in deep area. So we have like a, a cross bright treatment with light and authentication. We used also like a, in front of my station, Shimola, where the temperature is lower to have the present versus ocean warming and acidification because it's really want, what we want to know. And going on, what we want to know is what we do look in the future. So if you are considering the ecosystem, again, multi-stress is not really a problem. But I agree that it's, it can be a problem if you want to know the physiological mechanisms, like where which genes or which process is, is affected by ossification. And that's why like natural analogs are com complementary to, uh, to aquariums. It's they are, I've often we do some experiment in the field and bring them back in the lab because they're not exclusive. But yeah, it's, it's multi-stress environment is our future world, I think. Obviously, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Um, the next question says, can we learn anything useful from the response of corals to past analogs of ocean acidification, such as the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum? Okay, and I can see the question here. He's got corals in, in question marks. So I'm guessing this is a question for me. Um, so thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think actually in the the Quattrini paper I, that I showed the figure from, um, when uh, you put the phylogenetic tree, the, the really robust phylogenetic tree of the anthozoans, and you put it against sort of what we think the oceans were doing at that point in time with a molecular clock, and you look at which groups went extinct and which groups survived, and you can really start to see some really clear patterns. Um, a lot of the heavy calcifying groups really got knocked back at, at a lot of these different extinction events. Things in the deep sea, uh, more cryptic things, these things seem to do well. Um, things that also could take advantage of disturbed environments appeared to have done well. So um, I think looking at each one of these events and sort of even if you if we could, I mean, a lot of these things are fossils and the lineages are extinct, so it's sort of hard to really know, but maybe, you know, if, if we had a functional ecology approach and we had some rough ideas about what these groups of animals are do, were doing, um, and we could sort of look at, st even statistically analyze what got knocked back, what seemed to survive, and, and start to work with geologists or, or um, on putting this together. Yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, at the same time, a lot of these past signals of, of tools are probably still present in the genomes of the longer-lived lineages now. And I know there's a lot of square actinian lineages uh, that have been whole genomes published, particularly acroporids, which evolved in the last two to three million years. But we really need to start looking at a lot of these sort of other weird or, or, or not weird, but, you know, weird with quotation marks, so to speak, these other lineages and really looking at their genetic toolboxes in, in more detail. Um, I think there'll be a lot to learn. For example, Heliopora, right? As, as Sylvain said, as, as many papers have shown, Aragonite, massive aragonite skeleton seem to do well in much higher levels of PCO2. So there's something to be learned right there, right in front of our noses, right? So absolutely, let's do something. Cheers. Excellent. Um, so I, I'd like to recognize that we are at the top of the hour, but we have a few more really good questions that have come in. So as long um, as the speakers are amenable, I would love to, to ask them. And, and I recognize if people need to leave, um, thank you so much for joining. Um, so with Very that minimal. said, the, excellent, thank you. Um, th this next question is, can the presence of macroalgae or seagrass help corals fight their adaptation to ocean acidification? What do you think, you wanna try this one, Savan? Yeah, I think I uh, understand, uh, if I understand props because like uh, seagrass or macroalgae can suck up uh, the CO2, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, props locally, but what we saw, for example, the, uh, another the, the Italian seeps were Posidonia, so you grass is very abundant um, in the in the high CO two. You find like uh, the seagrass in very dense uh, uh, meadows, but they completely lack epiphytes. Uh, so it's not for corals, but um, you still have like a very uh, uh, 
uh, drastic loss of diversity in seagrass meadows. So there may be some uh, buffering effects of uh, microalgae or seagrass by pumping out CO2, but I don't think it will be enough uh, to, uh, to help corals, especially like uh, microalgae. So they are not very well uh, um, adapted to the higher temperature of the tropical zones. And in the higher latitude, for example, in Chikine, what we found is that, um, and this was also found in other temperate systems, you have a few couple of uh, um, macroalgae, especially turf algae, that will invade all the, the ecosystem, I would say. And, and this will inhibit the recruitment of corals. So I don't think it's very favorable for the corals. Um, not sure what the, the adaptation, like, I, 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 if, if they find the adaptation maybe is to inhibit recruitment and so uh, maybe if they can physiologically adapt, perhaps ecologically, uh, the microalgae will not help uh, the corals, the corals, sorry, <laughs> to survive. It not, yeah, hope that's clear the questions. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a question for James next. Um, okay. Somebody would like to know what the ecological role of the two genera of the other corals, in quotes, um, he found at the abundant <laughs> natural analog sites. Uh, okay, this is a question from Ricardo. Okay, so thank you for the question. It's something I've uh, often thought about myself. Um, there's not really a, a, a completely clear answer. Um, I think they're very similar to square actinian corals or to a lot of the soft corals you see on coral reefs. You know, they're looking for real estate. They're trying to get space on the reef. They have symbiodinaceae. They're eating some plankton, but they're also photosynthesizing. So they're kind of doing the same thing with a different toolkit. They're not calcifying. Um, they have fast growth rates. And so I think these, particularly these two species that uh, we find at these CO2 seeps, I think they can take advantage of disturbances much more quickly. There has been research done, particularly in the Caribbean in the 1980s by a researcher named Carlson, uh, a series of papers, really great papers, where they showed that in these sort of the surf zone, um, areas that get battered by storms, the corals often suffer mechanical damage or just get you know, peeled away. And these zoantherians are a little bit more rubbery, a little bit more resistant. They can come in and really colonize these disturbed areas very well, but in terms of wave energy and, and action. But if no hurricanes come along for several years, then probably they would slowly get knocked back or lose under normal conditions. Um, when it starts to become more difficult to calcify or it starts to become more difficult to, to settle or you have strange effects on larva, maybe these groups of animals can do better. And so I think, you know, there are a lot of reefs now where you see soft coral domination as well. And even in the 1980s, there's papers that suggest when things are a little bit bad, but not too bad, maybe in terms of turbidity or, or local stressors, it seems soft corals seem to do a bit better than square actinians. So you have all of these different groups and, and species within these groups with different abilities. But I think overall, you know, you change the, the rules of the game or you change the environment just a little bit. And, and this group has a slight advantage over another. And so I'd say these zoantherians, zoanthus palitho, they're kind of like a grass species that grows well after a fire, perhaps. But if another fire comes, of course, they'll burn too, I guess. So they're, I don't know. It's not a perfect answer, but it's sort of what I think these things are doing, if that makes sense. I can add, I think it's a very good question. And this is what we, we need to answer is uh, what, exactly. kind of ecosystem, is what kind of ecosystem service, habitat provisioning, sporting service, etc., will be provided by this new ecosystem, the future ecosystem. Yeah. There, there are there's a there is a study from Brazil where they showed that um, there were still fish communities above zoantherian dominated reefs, but they were not as diverse. Um, and certain groups got knocked back, and so yeah, with with zoantherians, with sponges, with corallimorpharians, we really need to know, you know, okay, if, if there's a lot of these, what happens to the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. James, that was a great lead-in. My apologies. Go ahead, Sylvain. Yeah, I was saying like I hope there will be a future webinar from colleagues who works on fish in that realm <laughs> that can discuss this. Yes, yes, we need to. That would be great. 
Um, so that was a great lead into to this next question. Um, is zoantheria biodiversity higher or lower at the OA analog sites compared to the ambient sites? Okay, excellent question. Uh, and I can give a, I think a pretty good answer. Lower, but abundance might be higher. Those like a classic disturbed environment. Um, lower diversity, but the two or three species that are doing well are having a, a very large party with all of their friends. Excellent. Um, and our final question for today is um, whether coral recruits can acclimatize in high CO2 and temperature. No. So uh, that's you. There's no quotes on corals, so that's yeah, you, Savannah. There's no quote on corals. Well, this is mostly the work by Ricardo Kurihara, Haruko, and, and rather than mine, because in where I work, we don't have so much per generation. Acclimatize is, is, uh, is not, for me, it's not within multiple generation so it would be single generation uh, i think it, i don't i don't have the answer i think there is some potential of adaptation like uh, seeing the results they, they got from palau or burake where you, you see some coral do well or even do better when they they are reared where they are being uh, 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 where they're born i would say so there is some kind of, of potential of adaptation Nine would certainly not be all species. And this again, joins what James said is perhaps in the future, uh, perhaps less diversity in, in PNG or you have very everywhere paritis, uh, uh, massive paritis that seems to do well, but it's very monophyletic uh, ecosystem. So simplified ecosystem again. So it would certainly not be all species. Maybe some species can acclimatize slash adapt to this uh, house of environment, but certainly not all. Yeah, I'd actually, I, I just quickly, I'm again, not a coral expert, but I think for all groups of animals, um, you've, with also, even with local stressors, you, you, you generally see, and it might not even be a loss of diversity sometimes if you're comparing two sites, but it's a loss of unique diversity. You know, if you have three disturbed sites, maybe the numbers of species at each site is 32, but they're all the same 32 species. Whereas if you have three pristine sites, maybe it's 32 there, but those 32 are different from each other, some of them, et cetera. So there's a lot of different levels, but um, it's it's not just numbers. It's, I think we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose a lot of uniqueness, I think. But cor corals will be around a lot longer than humans, I think. That's a, is that a positive ending? <laughs> <laughs> We, we had one more really interesting question come in, if you don't mind. Um, and it says, many quote unquote coral species can adjust their internal pH in acidified conditions. If so, is calcification a good trait to focus on? Would you suggest another alternative, especially since not all corals have skeletons? Wow, this is both you and me, Savan, this question. Yeah, so the internal pH, I think it's referencing to the calcifying fluid because what well, Maintaining internal pH is a basis of life, I would say, it's homeostasis. So yes, every coral has some ways of uh, maintaining a uh, stable internal pH or calcifying fluid pH, clearly. Uh, now it comes at an energy cost. Uh, it, every homeostatic uh, uh, physiological process costs in terms of ATP, and so like you will ha need a higher food senses, higher feeding, and so on. And so to maintain the same calcification rate, you would need to maintain the same uh, calcification fluid, uh, uh, calcifying fluid pH, and this will be more costly. So at the end of the day, uh, um, many cores have, it's a trade-off. If they can get a, a still a high calcification rate and uh, authentication, it will cost somewhere. Now, where mm -hmm. it is, maybe on fitness for recruitment, to produce offspring and so on. So I think is still a classification like for the real cores, I would say, <laughs> sorry, James, but they, no, need to no, grow. No. And they need to grow and be hard and so, such and to occupy space. So their way of growing is classification. So of course it's an important trait. For the other half uh, alternative, especially for those that do not have uh, a core, uh, a skeleton, uh, like the volunteers, and it's what uh, we're talking about, maybe with James, actually. It's true that they have great ways to, to, to survive. Uh, and, and I like the fact that 
the exams and so on. So but it's quite limited uh, um, in, in uh, the diverse Corif ecosystem. So again, like I I don't know, like the other alternative will favor perhaps this uh, these groups of organisms that do not have a skeleton. What do you think, James? Um, I mean, yeah, it's 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 a good question. It's something you know, it's a great thing to think about. Um, I think there's, you know, there's also, there's, there's octocrows that have proteinaceous axes and things like that. And then obviously I think the heliopods and nanopods have a different pathway to achieve what they're doing compared to say most of the scleractinians. Um, so there's a lot of different pathways to, to achieve some kind of hard skeleton. And there's a lot of different strategies to achieve some kind of structure. All of those require the animal to have homeostasis, I think. Um, but maybe some of those are more energy efficient in other ways than, than others, or maybe those, those energy calculations change under higher PCO2, for example. So I think to answer your question right now, um, I can't give you one specific alternative because really the research hasn't been done. I, I think, um, we need to look at a lot of different groups of animals and 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 figure it out. And maybe going back to the question by Noam, who mentioned, you know, we should look at which strategies survived in the past because we have fossils of calcifying organisms, but we don't have fossils of anemones or zoantherians because probably there were nothing, there was nothing left behind. So soft tissue, and we have, we're, unless we're very lucky. So I think. Um, you know, looking at phylog current phylogenetic trees and looking at where things went extinct, et cetera, might give us hints at what strategies we should be focusing on. But our fossil records incomplete, our genomic and, and omic databases incomplete. A um, lot of work to be done. Excellent. With that, um, I think I will I will cut off this really exciting discussion. Um, thank you both for for staying over time, um, James and Sylvain, for, no. for continuing this discussion. It's always um, fun to talk science. Good, good. Yeah, this is really enjoyable to listen to. Um, and thank you both for your really wonderful presentations today. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience um, for the great questions and participation in this edition of the Goa on webinar series. If you would like to stay up to date with the Goa On community, please join as a Goa On member at www.goaon.org. That's G O A hyphen O N.org. Um, and we'll be announcing the next webinar on Twitter and on our Goa On email listserv. So please keep an eye out for that announcement. Um, thanks again and see you next time. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye.